if I can invite Fies and Darto. To, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Alison Eskison, and I'm the Director of Knowledge and Accountability at GrowAsia. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, GrowAsia is an action-oriented partnership that brings together stakeholders from the government, private sector, civil society, academia, and most importantly, farmers, to work together on value chain initiatives that aim to improve productivity, profitability, and environmental sustainability for smallholder farmers. And one of the things that really struck me about today is that the panelists and the speakers that have been here have really committed um, to the concept that stakeholders or that smallholder farmers are key stakeholders in this. That this isn't a conversation about why do we need to engage smallholder farmers, but rather how should we go about engaging smallholder farmers. And as an industry, what can we do collectively to really advance and build on the strengths of um, the food and agriculture sector, but really move it forward so that we're able to address the looming concerns around global food security. Um, as um, Pak Franke had mentioned, as well as um, I think one of the ministers, um, in the next uh, several years, we're gonna see a giant increase in population growth. We'll grow to nine billion um, people around the world. And as there, as population increases and the, there's changing demands in terms of food, we'll have to figure out how to address that collectively. And um, already the um, FAO estimates that upwards of 80% of food that's consumed in Africa and Asia is produced by smallholder farmers. So to go and say we're going to tackle food security without engaging smallholder farmers is, a, is an equation that is, is faulty in its beginnings. Um, in ASEAN, we have 100 million smallholder farmers. Um, nearly 50% of those are women. And so as we start to think about how do we engage smallholder farmers, how do we increase environmental sustainability for smallholder farmers while increasing their productivity as well as their net income, we'll need to think about strategies that both work for men as well as for women. Um, I'd like to invite each of our panelists to say a few words about the work that they do, and then we'll go right into questions. And um, I understand that the internet uh, access is intermittent. So at the very end, I will ask for questions. And by any means, if you have questions, please shoot your hand up, and I'm happy to um, call on you uh, should the internet not start working. Um, Bish, would you like to start? Uh, good morning. I, my name is Bish Then I work for Unilever. Um, as Unilever, we are large buyers of several commodities, uh, starting be it palm oil, be it uh, uh, vanilla, be it uh, tea. Um, and as a part of our sourcing initiative, smallholders form a very important part of our sourcing chains. It's not that we have lots of uh, solutions, but we've tried a lot of stuff, failed in many places, and have a few learnings that I'll try and share today. Uh, in terms of what we've learned from our experiences working with smallholders across the world. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Simon. I represent Bayer. I've um, been obviously asked to give a bit of a corporate speech, um, which would be a repetition very much of what we've heard before, so I'm trying to divert a little bit from that. But um, I think we all agree that to at least try to solve the problem. And I dare to say it's difficult to, to really see the solution yet, but to try to solve the problem of feeding the world, we will have to one adapt technology. I, I guess everybody in the room here will agree. And for that, there was a bit of a discussion on the, on the former channel, uh, of the former panel, sorry, um, which, to my mind, is the essence of it, and that is we need to do it together. Um, our company has 20,000 employees, and I would argue today if I were to deploy them all just in Indonesia, we would still not be really able to move the needle. So, fact of the matter is we need to work together and try to find solutions together. It's not one company or one body or one government that will solve it. Good morning. Just slightly before lunch, and I, it's food security issue. We are between food security and uh, getting you to answer what are solutions for food security. So with that, I am Xiang He, representing the plant science industry. 
represent the technology provider for, plant, for crop protection, pesticides, biotechnology, and seeds. And our fundamental question today is, how do we enable our farmers to cope with 21st century problem with the state-of-the-art technology? We invest multi-billion dollars every year, and a very recent report last week is that we spent 11 years to get one product to the marketplace with a 283 million. So the question is, how fast after the 11 years can we bring it to the hands of the farmers in Asia? Anybody wants to make a wild guess? It takes us an average for five to seven years more before the farmers actually have the tool in his hand. So how can we equip that technology to our farms at a quicker pace? We as industry represent, we work very closely with the government in terms of RZ harmonization and getting regular system up to speed so that the farmers in Asia will have the same competitive advantage and the same tool to mitigate and work together for adaptation and mitigate climate change. Climate does not wait for us. Therefore, just like my previous speakers, we need functional, predictable regulatory system to ensure that our farmers are equipped and be able to cope. The technique before I pass the mic is, we all try to paint broad brush policy. Indonesia, 14% of the GDP is in agriculture, with 40% of the 14% GDP in agriculture, and 40% of agriculture people, meaning farmers, are involved in agriculture. But the average income per capita of farmer is about 900 US dollars, compared to an Australian farmer who is doing 40,000 US dollars. So there's tremendous gap and an opportunity for farmers to be better competitive and be able to supply between ASEAN and also with the international market, we're bringing in 60 million more people into ASEAN in the next 10 years. So maybe we'll have a more robust discussion after this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I'm Darto. Uh, I am representing uh, smallholders uh, in Indonesia. Uh, around uh, 4 million uh, smallholders in Indonesia on palm oil. And my organization, uh, our members, around uh, 48,000 uh, members. Uh, our, our organization uh, work in collaboration with other organizations, uh, local, national, and international organizations, toward uh, sustainable palm oil. To achieve uh, sustainable palm oil uh, at smallholders level, we tried to closing the gaps uh, of smallholders, such as uh, productivity. Uh, productivity uh, in smallholders level around uh, 12 uh, ton per, per year. And uh, the problem also about the capacity of smallholders, such as uh, good agriculture practices. Uh, beside that, we also doing land mapping to understanding of uh, distribution of smallholders because the independent smallholders in Indonesia, they, they skaters, they don't consolidate uh, on one uh, location. They, they skaters, uh, this is uh, very difficult to, to understand about the uh, uh, smallholders position. And the expectation of the mapping is identified uh, distribution and problem of the smallholders so that they the future to get the best solution toward uh, sustainability and we also cooperate with uh, central government and local government to success ispo indonesian sustainable palm oil and also conduct uh, rspo certification uh, my our organization uh, support by uh, RSPO uh, to get uh, RSPO certification in Riau around uh, 3,000 uh, hectares. Uh, our organization also has worked with the Philips government and several organizations towards sustainable palm oil integrated with the rule and authority of the Philips. Uh, this is the opportunity now is a uh, law of the village, uh, number number six, uh, to give uh, author, authority uh, 
for the village to manage uh, the village in the ground. And I think uh, the opportunity also uh, to increase the capacity uh, of the head of the village to manage palm oil in the ground. And therefore, we have announced a program of sustainable palm oil village on, in Bahasa is uh, Desa Sabit Lestari. The program is to encourage the villagers as actor in sustainable palm oil. Sustainable palm oil village aims not only to change the negative image of Indonesian palm oil. This is initiative we want to uh, support the village to develop their rural areas and improve the people living standard while contribute to government's uh, program of rural development in line with environmental and socio-economic perspective. Sustainable palm oil village is our way to help manage the community-based development of oil palm plantation and hence the good agriculture practice toward better productivity in a limited land and strengthen the farmers group and cooperative to be able to collaborate in traceability supply chain. Sustainable palm oil village also is not all about palm oil production only. It mainly concerns on sustainable production, trace traceability, land use management, and food security. So important is the authority of the village and uh, village rule to protect the important areas at the at the village. This is uh, opportunity by uh, law number number six uh, by national uh, regulation. The small horse initiative tries to sort out the issue in productivity instead of expansion, legality of uh, legality of land ownership, supply chain and facilitate and facilitation to financial institution, especially in the times of replanting like these days, uh, like uh, BPDP support for smallholders on the replanting in, in Riau uh, some days ago. And, uh, and the last point, in generally on palm oil, we also appreciate the initiative of uh, Mr. President, Bapak uh, Jokowi, to conduct moratorium on palm oil. This is a great opportunity to the smallholders to get empowerment, cooperation in sale fresh fruit bunch with the companies, and big opportunity to the protect uh, area, like uh, peatland, uh, forests and food crops. The moratorium also can complement initiatives already exist, such as uh, ISPO, RSPO, and also to strengthen uh, IPOP commitment, Indonesian palm oil commitment, uh, like uh, human rights, no deforestation, and uh, no exploitation. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all those comments. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Dr. that was a wonderful example of very concrete action of what the uh, Indonesian smallholder palm oil union is doing. I wonder, do others have examples of how you're engaging with smallholder farmers that you'd like to share? So, I mean, we work across uh, several uh, landscapes. So we work with smallholder farmers in Africa for tea. Uh, we work with smallholder farmers in Madagascar for vanilla. Palm for smallholder farmers in Palm in uh, Sumatra and uh, Kalimantan now, uh, within Vietnam and in India as well. Our learning has been that smallholders typically have five kinds of issues. The first one is about access to planting material or gene stock. The second one is about access to inputs, which is things like pesticides, fertilizers. Uh, third one is about access to know-how, when to plant, when to harvest, when to irrigate. The fourth issue that they have is access to markets, and the fifth one is access to financing. Now, most smallholder programs tend to focus on one aspect of this pentagon. Uh, and typically, we've found that programs are not scalable 
unless you can find holistic programs which, uh, which address all five where relevant, uh, all five aspects of the problem. And uh, like Simon mentioned in his opening remarks, you cannot solve the, uh, the five uh, dimensions of the problem without collaborating. And I think that's key to it. So you need to get more, more and more uh, I mean, players to collaborate to solve the problem. So that's been our learning from the thing. Add to that in countries like Indonesia, there are issues of land rights, uh, which need addressing as a fundamental uh, basic. Yeah, maybe let me react uh, with a bit of a story. Um, I personally moved in 2004 into one of the smallest countries in the world, the world with just two million inhabitants, which is called Slovenia. And in 2004, actually, the European Union extension happened to that country. And as you can imagine, with the number of people and being a very small country, by definition, everybody there was a small holder. And very often active in high value crops, like wine production or, or grapes, but all of a sudden on the open market competing it, uh, against Italy, etc., you can imagine also the fear that was there. What helped, and this is where I'm very much in agreement with the previous panel again, was at least there was a clear regulatory framework. People knew what they had to expect and with that, you would be seeing certain people really going into investment and others going out of business. And having spent now seven months in Asia, where we as, as buyer are collaborating, for example, on the Better Rice Initiative, um, I always come back to, to, to looking at this and saying, you know, if people cannot make a living out of it, we may also have to call for a different solution. And we can discuss here as long as we want, um, but to my mind, if I'm a one hectare rice farmer, and even if I'm able to increase production by 100%, which in theory would be possible, it still is not gonna pay the bill. And in many a case, I'd rather go and drive a taxi in Jakarta or Bangkok or wherever, wherever it is. And that's where we need to be looking at different solutions. Yeah? Well, we need to be sitting there and saying, how can we, on the one hand, leave him the comfort of owning his land, but on the other hand, also give him the opportunity to look at how can he better make a living? And here, a question of renting out land and with that having a secondary income, but giving an opportunity to a community also to, let's say, farm at a more professional level is for me one of the things where talking about collaboration, it could make a difference. Thank you. Agriculture has to split into three pieces. The first piece is the largest farmer who are already in a commercialization skill that supports your country agriculture GDP, whether it's plantation or banana plantation in the Philippines or the rice exporters in Vietnam. There is another group of farmers that is going to supply between your national requirement to the wet markets that Bruce said yesterday or to your hypermarkets. Those are your domestic group. Then the third piece are the small scale farmers who will then aggregate into a larger scale. Each of them requires a very different support, whether it's financially, whether it's policy, whether it's access to market. That's why we cannot pay all. Everybody's small farmers know. Between that agriculture space, that's an agriculture entrepreneurship, just, just now over the panel says, oh, nobody wants to go into agriculture. But why do you see so many agriculture sitting in this room? Because a lot of people are entrepreneurial. We need to build a different dimension, a different name, a different respect for agriculture that is driving food security to us globally, whether it's within ASEAN, one. Number two is, we just finished a um, four-year program in India, reaching out to 100,000 families in agriculture. That program brings their GAP, good agriculture practice, brings them to closer to market with better produce, better value for the crop, and the potential to export 
So again, going back to the partnership within the local community, within the government, you empower the farmer into a better life. Without that technology, without that knowledge, and yet preservation and re respecting the local technology, but bringing it into the next level of productivity. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, and so to touch on that, one of the questions, or there's actually several questions that are going around the audience that they're voting on, um, really comes back to technology. And so two of them, um, one is around how do you consolidate better uh, adoption of technology, but then also how do you move from those successful pilots and demos and try to reach scale? And, and how do we do that? I know, Simon, you've already mentioned collaboration, but what, what would collaboration look like in that space for Bayer? Well, the question is always how quickly do you want to adopt technology? Now, I was giving you the analogy of the European Union expansion where via legislation within basically 18 months, very specific now to, uh, to agrochemicals, everything was phased out which was not according to the re or new regulatory framework. Now we all know in our countries here we tend to have a different approach to it, which would be we come with a new regulation, but whatever is registered stays on the market. That doesn't necessarily support very quick adaptation of technology. Another one is, to a certain degree, we need to acknowledge that it's a question of education. So giving better technology to a farmer who doesn't know how to use it is most probably also not going to yield anything. I would even argue it would be a waste of it. So to my mind, it's also a question of do you want to go more towards consolidating technologies in certain hands? Um, an example can be licensing schemes and basically sit there and say, you know, not everybody and, and, you know, I had a nice discussion over dinner yesterday, but in essence, it's today in many a country easier to buy an agrochemical than a packet of cigarettes. Now, is that correct? Were we to come and say, actually, there needs to be a certain standard of education to be allowed to be applying chemicals, that would allow also for a higher technology standard. And with that, you would probably kill a couple of birds with one shot and get a consolidation in where you get specialized service providers, for example. So <clears throat> I think uh, while there's, uh, there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of input technologies, one of the things that we find incredibly powerful is the use of mobile platforms, uh, in, uh, especially for smallholder farmers. So we are working with uh, tea plantation, uh, smallholder tea, uh, farmers in tea and coconut sugar in Indonesia. We are kicking off a pilot with a company called Tone in, in Sumatra for palm. Uh, essentially for two things. One is, of course, to provide training um, in terms of good agricultural practices. But the other big uh, factor which uh, creates almost a, it creates a massive jump is just transparency in terms of pricing in the value chain. So allowing a smallholder to know what the pricing in the, the, what the right pricing in the value chain is creates a whole shift uh, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the way the thing operates. So that's one of the big learnings that we've had. Thank you. Uh, Darto, you had mentioned um, earlier the need for smallholder farmers to have capacity building. And Simon, you mentioned um, possibly having a more centralized approach in terms of looking at uh, standards in order to facilitate uh, greater health and safety practices. And Bis, you're talking about the use of mobile technology. When you think about the need for knowledge, how does that translate for not just good agricultural practices, but also uh, environmental resource management? So for example, um, farming accounts for 70% of water use in the world today. Um, and what are the measures in place from a smallholder farmer's perspective that are reasonable to look around um, reducing, reusing, and recycling water, but then also from companies' perspectives. How are you looking at your supply chain and, and helping to drive change through that? 
I guess start to, for, for farmers, what, what do farmers need? What kind of capacity building do you believe they would prioritize? Um, yeah, uh, about the smallholders' capacity on palm oil, uh, yeah, around for, uh, 2.8 uh, million uh, smallholders, uh, because in smallholders level, uh, have to type uh, smallholders. The first uh, scheme smallholders, uh, like plasma, plasma smallholders. And second, independent smallholders. Independent smallholders is uh, bigger on palm oil, around uh, 2.8 uh, uh, million uh, smallholders. Uh, the majority of the problem uh, in independent smallholders is they don't have organization to increase the capacity to establish, uh, uh, to establish the standard on sustainable palm oil, uh, like uh, certification uh, to, to easy for them uh, on supply chain. And I think for me, uh, specifically for independent smallholders, the first step is uh, establish the smallholders organization. Uh, like, uh, I think BUMDES. BUMDES in Bahasa is uh, Badan Usaha Milik Desa, uh, village uh, uh, owned companies, uh, like uh, village owned enterprise. Uh, this is a uh, formal uh, village organization uh, support by national regulation uh, number uh, number six uh, about the village. I think the investor uh, technology can collaborate can collaboration with with, with the village uh, through village uh, owned enterprise uh, to support the farmers. Yeah, so I would agree with that. Uh, I think one of the key ish challenges that we faced is uh, aggregation of uh, smallholders especially. Uh, we've worked with, so whenever we've tried working with individual smallholders, small pilots work, but they are usually not scalable because um, you f we find it very difficult. You can find great success with 250 farmers. When you try and make it 250,000 farmers, it then kind of trips over because it's not scalable. Um, and pretty much on the lines of what you said, that uh, there are three kinds of models that we find uh, uh, are quite efficient. The first one is lose working groups of farmers uh, on the lines of the uh, village-owned enterprise. The second type, which is slightly more evolved, is the formal cooperative. And in some markets, we've seen farmers forming farming companies where uh, the land is actually a part of this, the capital that goes into creating a farming company. And that company can then uh, invest in appropriate technology, uh, downstream processing, access to markets, and, and the rest of it. So pretty much on the lines of what you said. Um, water is a scar com scarce commodity. Water is more expensive than petroleum today. If you go to 7-Eleven, one bottle is what, a dollar each right now. As we use agriculture, water is going to be very more crucial today. India is suffering from over, drain, over uh, drilling of water. Technology is in place in the US. There's drought resistance crop that has been utilized by farmers. Even Iri has drought resistance rice. There is also zero tilling, whereby with zero tillage, you will preserve the soil moisture on the surface of your soil, meaning farmers will have to use, you're able to use less water, preserving your topsoil. And these are the benefits that the Brazilian and North American farmers have been enjoying. But unfortunately, this technology is only available in few countries like Philippines and Vietnam today, whereas the rest of the Asia uh, farmers have not had the opportunity to be able to farm effectively, preserve their land in a higher conservation level to preserve the soil carbon. Again, innovation 
into the hands of the farmers in a timely manner is crucial to ensure that they be able to do adaptation and mitigation to climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, one of the questions that's coming from the audience is around policy and regulation. Um, Simon, would you like to give, uh, if you had to pick one or two policies that you think are essential um, to help create sustainable farming, particularly in Indonesia, what would they be? Well, I probably would, would again uh, try to build a bit of an analogy to the EU. Um, I think we're all aware today that the EU has a lot of flaws. Um, when you come and look at ASEAN, I see a unique opportunity to also learn from the good sides of what the EU did. And to my mind, one of the stories that could really bring things forward would be a common regulatory framework, which would allow then also to be more active in terms of making sure you produce tradable goods. Uh, because today you're in a situation that even reasonably educated farmers may end up having their produce rejected by an importing nation and it can sometimes be just the northern neighbor of many of the um, northern Asian countries um, who on the one side still happily produces compounds for this part of the world but on the other hand does not accept it on their own grounds anymore. And that's something where, where I find the ASEAN governments should use the opportunity to make sure they're also competitive in that sense. And would probably also help on the other topic that we had before in terms of inter-ASEAN trade, because you do have basically five big producers of rice, of which some are net exporters, some are net importers, and our friend from Myanmar this morning was, was nicely also alluding to it. New ones coming up, they want to be on the market again or actually are on the market already. And there is one of the topics also. We all know that we're talking about shortages, but at the same time, there is quite a bit to go around where if we had a better distribution, it would actually help everybody. Thank you. Um, I have two points. First is again um, echoing what Simon has said is uh, ASEAN has, is a community and it's an opportunity for multilateral trade and Indonesia is not isolated from the whole AEC 2015. We've been working in ASEAN for the 10, 10 over years to ensure that we get a harmonization program in place because as you know, regulators, governments are all running on a negative deficit. How can we share resources in terms of regulatory the whole ASEAN community? Can we share dossiers? If something is approved by Malaysia, by Indonesia, the other government should look upon it as, yes, it is same agroecology environment, we should mutually respect um, that ASEAN harmonization piece, therefore leveraging on resources, technical expertise across the ASEAN platform, that's number one. Number two, Indonesia and for the, our the farmers people or the my member companies, we are here and been here for the last 40, 50 years, growing together with the Indonesia, supporting its agriculture GDP to where Indonesia is today. And we are a partner to Indonesian growth, and therefore we look forward to a sound policy that will promote sound FDI environment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, we have so many questions, and I'm afraid we are virtually out of time. Um, so just to summarize what I've heard today, and, and maybe to pose something to all of you as, as we move forward in today and, to, and tomorrow's discussion. Um, so in wrapping up, We've heard a lot about the need for enabling environment and policy and regulation to set the tone and to really allow for greater uh, investment in sustainability, uh, sustainable agriculture. We've also heard about, um, so very succinctly put from this, around the five different critical elements that need to be incorporated and to really achieve sustainable agriculture. Um, and that without any one of those five, you really sacrifice the ability to hit scale. Um, but I think, what resonates most with me is what um, Pak Darto said, in that really it's about action on the ground and trying to engage smallholder farmers, and that we can get into this horrible, vicious circle of um, what's, what happens first. I won't start any action on the ground until there's an enabling environment that's suitable. 
with the government saying, well, how can I make change if I can't demonstrate that this is going to result in improvements for my citizenry? And really, I think that as we think about today, tomorrow, and moving forward, one of the things that we need to come back to is how can we work together today um, to build the trust among all the different stakeholders, not only in the value chain, but across civil society, as well as financial intermediaries, um, to the degree that we believe that you need financial institutions to have a role in having strong, sustainable value chains, then we need to think about how do we engage them early in the conversation rather than as, as an after fact, and that we move forward as far as we can, and when there's a bottleneck that comes to the enabling environment, then being able to engage the government um, in a way that's meaningful because they've been part of that journey with us all the way through. And so I hope that as we move forward, um, that we'll all think uh, through what can our each action steps be um, as, we, as we really try to um, have greater sustainable agriculture. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you.